In this video, we're going to talk about the eyes. There are a ton of eye diseases on the NCCPA blueprint, and we're going to spread them out over the course of two videos. In this video, we're going to focus on diseases that cause a red eye. And that means we get to play a little game I call Disgusting Eye Picture Show and Tell. Consider yourself warned. We're organizing these disorders more or less anatomically, starting in front of the eye with the eyelids, and then moving deeper and deeper to the cornea and the iris. So let's start outside the eyeball with the eyelids. First, let's review three inflammatory conditions, chalazion, hordeolum, and anterior blepharitis. Chalazion is inflammation of the internal mybobian sebaceous glands, which causes eyelid swelling. So here you can see that the lid looks swollen and red and inflamed, and then when you pull down the lid, there's all this redness, but the infection isn't on the mucosal surface. It's deep inside the lid. This is usually a self-limited process, but if it persists, you can do a surgical excision or inject steroids into the lesion. A hordeolum is also known as a sty. This is an infection of the external sebaceous glands of the eyelid, which results in a tender red swollen area at the margin or edge of the eyelid. Here you see the pustule forming right on the edge of the eyelid, so it's externally visible. And if you pull down on the lid here, you might still see some redness, but again, there's the pustule on the lid margin. You treat this by applying a warm compress three or four times a day for about 10 to 15 minutes. If it doesn't resolve in 48 hours or so, you might need to use an antibiotic ointment or possibly perform an incision and drainage. But in general, this can usually be treated conservatively with warm compresses. Then anterior blepharitis can either be due to infection of the eyelid and the lashes due to staph aureus, where the lid's swollen and red or maybe some golden crust forms, or it can be a form of seborrheic dermatitis of the lid and the lashes with greasy scales and dandruff around the lashes. So here you see the golden colored scale and dandruff-like changes around the lashes. Treatment includes washing the lid margins daily with a gentle shampoo and gently removing the scales with a cotton ball. And you can also apply antibiotic ointment to the lid margins. Two other eyelid pathologies that you just need to be able to recognize are ectropion and entropion. Ectropion is where the lid margin is turned out, away from the eye, so that the conjunctival surface is exposed. This can result from age or trauma or infection. And entropion is where the lid margin turns inward as a result of chronic inflammation or scarring. This turns the eyelashes inward so that they rub against the eye, and that can cause irritation and injury. So either of these conditions could be treated surgically. Next, let's talk about infection of the tissue around the eye, which could either be orbital cellulitis or periorbital cellulitis. Orbital cellulitis is much more severe than periorbital cellulitis because periorbital cellulitis just involves the skin in front of the eye, like the eyelid. But orbital cellulitis actually involves the content of the orbit itself, like the fat and the extraocular muscles. But neither one actually involves the eyeball itself. So both orbital cellulitis and periorbital cellulitis can present with redness and swelling and pain. But with orbital cellulitis, there might be proptosis or bulging of the eye. There might be pain with eye movement. There might be ophthalmoplegia, which is weakness or paralysis of the extraocular muscles. And that could lead to diplopia. And then rarely, the patient might have impaired vision. It's important to recognize orbital cellulitis because up to 10% of patients will have permanent vision loss and 1 or 2% will die from orbital cellulitis, so it's potentially very dangerous. And we diagnose orbital cellulitis with a CT scan, and then treatment includes hospitalization, because this is a medical emergency, broad-spectrum IV antibiotics, like vancomycin, plus either a third-generation cephalosporin, like ceftriaxone, or an extended-spectrum penicillin, like ampicillin sulbactam or piperacillin tazobactam. Staph and strep are the most common bugs that cause this, but anaerobes can also be a problem, so sometimes metronidazole is added. And then you also want to consult an ophthalmologist in case surgical drainage is required. Dacryoadenitis is infection and inflammation of the lacrimal glands, the tear glands. Dacryo means tears. If you have trouble remembering that, the word cry is hidden right there. Dacryoadenitis is often caused by viruses like mumps virus or EBV. But bacteria like staph and group A strep and Neisseria gonorrhea can cause it too. The lacrimal glands are located near the upper outer portion of each eye. So dacryoadenitis causes swelling, redness, and tenderness along the upper eyelid. And sometimes there will be purulent discharge. We treat this with warm compresses, NSAIDs for the pain and inflammation, and you can culture the discharge to look for evidence of bacterial infection. You might treat with systemic antibiotics like cephalexin until the culture comes back. 
Next up, let's talk about conjunctivitis, which is commonly known as pink eye. The term conjunctivitis just means that the conjunctivae are inflamed, not necessarily infected. Conjunctivitis is called pink eye because as the conjunctiva gets inflamed and the blood vessels stand out, it makes the sclera look pink. Now the eye may be mildly painful or itchy, and there's usually some discharge, which could be watery or it could be more purulent. The three main causes of conjunctivitis are viral infections, bacterial infections, and allergies. The most common cause of viral conjunctivitis is adenovirus, which is highly contagious, so it's easy to spread it from one eye to the other, and it's easy to spread from person to person. You could treat the symptoms with antihistamine eye drops, but no treatment is really necessary. The most common causes of bacterial conjunctivitis are staph aureus and strep pneumoniae, but also think about Neisseria gonorrhea and Chlamydia trachomatis in sexually active patients, or in neonates if the mother is infected with Neisseria or Chlamydia. Bacterial conjunctivitis classically causes a more purulent discharge, with thick pus coming out of the eye 24 hours a day, especially on your exam. Now, we typically treat bacterial conjunctivitis with antibiotic ointment or antibiotic eye drops. And then allergic conjunctivitis acts a lot like viral conjunctivitis. You have bilateral watery discharge plus itching. You can treat with antihistamines, either antihistamine eye drops or systemic antihistamines, especially if the patient also has nasal allergy symptoms. Now, one other conjunctival pathology I want to mention in passing, just so you can identify it, is called a pterygium. A pterygium is this triangular band of thickened conjunctival tissue. It's really only a problem when it gets big enough to cover the cornea and interfere with vision. And at that point, you surgically resect it. Next, let's talk about a couple of injuries to the cornea, which is the clear dome that sits in front of the iris and the pupil to let light in. If you get a foreign body in the eye, even just an eyelash or a fingernail or a contact lens, that can lead to a corneal abrasion, these little scratches on the cornea which you can see with a slit lamp or you stain with fluorescein and then you use a woods lamp or a cobalt blue light, the blue filter on your ophthalmoscope. But corneal abrasions are really, really painful and they may cause some blurring of the vision. So how do we treat a corneal abrasion? Well, first you perform a thorough eye exam and you irrigate to remove any of the foreign bodies. Then you could use topical antibiotics like erythromycin ointment or a quinolone eye drop. And then pay attention to this one. Pressure patching is optional, but only for the first 24 hours or less, and it's generally not necessary. And pressure patching is contraindicated if a foreign body is present. You can give systemic opioids or NSAID eye drops to control the pain, but you do not prescribe topical anesthetic eye drops or steroid eye drops. Now, sometimes you'll see a divot or a defect in the epithelial surface of the cornea, which is called a corneal ulcer. This usually occurs due to infection of the cornea, although chronic inflammatory states can sometimes do it as well. Corneal ulcers are visible as these little opaque circles on the surface of the cornea. And you can also see them with fluorescein staining. Now, this patient has a gonococcal infection of the eye, which is why there's so much conjunctivitis going on. And then this patient has herpes infection of the cornea, which is called herpes simplex keratitis. So herpes simplex ulcers are notable for their branching pattern or dendritic pattern or geographic pattern. You can also see a similar pattern with herpes zoster that affects the eye. Let's also mention how you manage a patient with foreign body in the eye. First of all, you want to stain with fluorescein and examine it carefully with a woods lamp. And then you can try to remove the foreign body with a moist cotton swab and then look for any injury to the underlying tissue. Another cause of red eye that's easy to diagnose on inspection is a hyphema. This is where there's trauma to the eye, or possibly eye surgery, that results in blood pooling in the anterior chamber of the eye, behind the cornea, but in front of the iris. It can usually be managed with pain control and dilation of the pupil, but sometimes these patients need surgery to drain the blood. And finally, I want to mention uveitis, which is not in the blueprint, but I'm including it for completeness. Uveitis is inflammation of the iris, the ciliary bodies, and the choroid, the vascular layer in the back of the eye. So you could talk about anterior uveitis or posterior uveitis. Anterior uveitis is usually related to systemic inflammatory diseases like reactive arthritis, ankylosing spondylitis, juvenile idiopathic arthritis, or sarcoidosis. And posterior uveitis is most commonly caused by infections like herpes simplex, CMV, toxoplasma, and Bartonella, which causes cat scratch disease, or rarely even syphilis. Anterior uveitis causes pain and redness of the iris, and that redness often extends into the conjunctiva as well. Posterior uveitis causes painless, mild vision abnormalities because the posterior uveal tract sits right up against the retina in the back of the eye. 
And if there's an infection, you can treat with topical antibiotics. If there's no infection, but instead one of these systemic inflammatory diseases, we treat with steroids, either topical or systemic glucocorticoids. Now it's time for the end of session quiz. So pause the video, work through those questions, then we'll go through the answers together. First question. A four-year-old girl was brought to the physician for two days of itchy, watery eyes. It began in the left eye initially, and then it spread to the right eye. The eyes were matted shut this morning. Physical exam shows diffuse injection of the conjunctive bilaterally. What's the most likely diagnosis, and what's the most appropriate treatment? So this is pink eye, or conjunctivitis, right? And it's most likely viral conjunctivitis, since it started in one eye and then spread. It's not likely to be bacterial conjunctivitis because the discharge is watery, not purulent. And what's the most common virus that causes viral conjunctivitis? Adenovirus. And then the treatment for viral conjunctivitis is supportive care, like antihistamine eye drops as needed, but no antibiotic therapy is indicated. Next, what distinguishes a hordeolum from a chalazion? So a hordeolum is swelling at the eyelid margin, the conjunctival surface, and a chalazion is swelling within the eyelid from an inflamed meibomian gland. And last question. A 35-year-old man comes to the physician with two days of redness and swelling around the right eye and pain with movement of the eye. He also has some double vision. Physical exam shows proptosis or bulging of the right eye and some weakness of the extraocular muscles. So what are the most appropriate next steps in managing this patient? Well, this presentation, pain, redness, proptosis, and extraocular muscle involvement is concerning for orbital cellulitis, which involves the contents of the orbit, the fat and the muscles. Remember, this is a medical emergency, so you don't really want to fool around. So the first step is to get a CT of the orbit to make the diagnosis. And then this patient needs to be hospitalized, you need to consult an ophthalmologist, and you need to start broad-spectrum IV antibiotics like vancomycin plus ceftriaxone. And that's it for now. I'll see you next time.